You're listening to the Peace Corner podcast. In each episode, we talk to a different peace builder working in a different region, telling a different story. To hear more, please click subscribe. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, and more. Worldwide, people are separated in the name of national security. Thousands of miles of walls and barbed wire, all with the sole purpose to keep out the other, the unknown. But all this comes at a cost. Not only the trillions of dollars invested in steel, stone and weapons, but also at the cost of our shared humanity. Build that wall! Build that wall! Today, a heavily fortified border with both sides constantly prepared for war. Tensions rising between India and Pakistan over Kashmir. But now, a new era of peace building is on the horizon, inspired by those who refuse to identify particular groups or demographics as threats to others. A group of non-conformists with one goal, to redefine security in an inclusive and egalitarian way. To find out more, we spoke to one of those peace builders, seeking ways to reframe our security as a shared responsibility. Kerry Kennedy is the Associate General Secretary for International Programs at AFSC. We asked her, what makes us secure, and how can we reshape our security in a way that is inclusive and shared? Okay, hello and welcome to uh, another episode of the Peace Corner podcast. Today we have Kerry Kennedy. Kerry, nice to have you here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. And you're joining us from Pittsburgh today, is that correct? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. All good over there, I hope? Yes, everything's well. Excellent. Good. So, shall we dive in? Yes, let's. All right. Let's start at the start. Uh, Can you still remember when you became interested in peace building? I can. So I grew up in a large middle class family. Uh, so I was the only girl uh, with uh, five brothers. <laughs> so so I've always been very deeply um, committed to equality. And um, I went to the Peace Corps immediately after college. I, I uh, wanted to travel. I wanted to learn other languages and other cultures. And then came back um, after the Peace Corps and was working in more development-oriented work, micro micro enterprise work based out of New York City. And I was in New York on 9-11, September 2001, uh, when the World Trade Center was hit. I, at that day, I was working on Rikers Island, which was a prison right outside New York City, and uh, my twin brother was in the World Trade Center. So he uh, was on the 85th floor and the he was in the North Tower and that building was hit uh, on the 93rd floor. But I didn't know that. So the I was in the prison, the prison locked down. We rushed to Manhattan um, and it was a horrible day. It was just a really awful day. I didn't know for hours if he made it. And he did, he, he lived. But thousands did not live on that day. And that moved me uh, to, to move into peace building and to think about why people commit these, uh, why people commit violence, why there's war and how we recover after a war. Um, so that was really a critical point in my in my career. Well, that's quite an event to uh, to encourage that. Yeah. You, you mentioned the uh, the Peace Corps there. Was that when you spent your time in Tonga? Yes. Yeah. The Kingdom of Tonga. I lived uh-huh. on a tiny tiny little island called Niwa Toputapu. And um, it was, you know, it's, you had to travel on a little eight seater plane to get there. A plane came every, every six weeks. Um, there was no electricity. I learned how to spearfish. Um, I learned to speak Tongan. And I built uh, with the youth there, a small school that um, practiced mechanical engineering, because at that time in the 1990s, there was an influx of machines. So radios, uh, cars, uh, watches, generators, and nobody knew how to fix it. So we lived on this six square mile island and and, and when something broke down, it would just go into a corner of the island and, and just rot. So we built this little four room school so that the youth who had been leaving the island to look for jobs and education and opportunity uh, could repair these small electronics. Um, and that would also help the sustainability of the island. And so so that uh, that experience really um, taught me the delicacies of ecologies and also how uh, people and countries can be affected by decisions that are made far away from 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 their reality, um, and you know now they're worrying about climate change in this tiny little island, and 
um, and, and haven't done a, a lot to contribute to uh, the, the change in climate. So yeah, that was a wonderful experience. Excellent. So you're welcome nicely there as one of, I'm guessing, a very few foreign people in that small country. I yes, there was actually there was another German man who was uh, who has who's raised a family there, and I was the only other foreigner at that period of time. And it, they were very lovely and welcoming. And and when I left, it was really funny. They did this big skit and had this big feast where they showed me coming into the island. And you know, as a toddler, I couldn't speak. I didn't know how to light a fire. I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't fish. I couldn't do anything. And then they left and said, I'm a full-fledged a, a Tongan. So yeah, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. That's excellent. And so after these experiences, that you, the two you've spoken about, what encouraged you to pursue it as a career? There are many ways we can get into peace building, but for you who do it as a career, what encouraged that choice? Yeah. So it really was, you know, this, the, the 9-11 attack, like really led me to graduate school to start to study uh, violence and start to study, um, I, I, really reconciliation. So then I spent the next 10 years working on governance, post-conflict reconciliation, uh, really working a lot on election cycles um, and really, really great work. I was in many conflict zones. So I was in Afghanistan, I was in Liberia, I was in Ethiopia uh, and East Timor and spent a a decade doing that. Uh, I was in Liberia after the, that war ended and was working with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So they, um, I at this point was executive director of another organization called Women's Campaign International, and we were helping them to build out a gender unit for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I uh, spent six weeks traveling across the country um, which had been devastated by war. We were traveling during the rainy season. There was, uh, you know, roads were washed out. We would end up, uh, you know, staying in, in in a little village where we hadn't intended to stay in nice people's homes, which allowed us to sleep on their floors. And um, it was, we were going into communities where um, there hadn't been a, a lot of people coming to to talk to them and to see them and to travel by road to the country. And I heard story after story from women of um of of just horrific rape and assault and and um and I had a friend who who hid in a latrine while her entire family had been killed uh, and and then talked about noises of animals that came afterwards like wild dogs and it was it was a really horrific um it was really horrific stories that needed to be told and people were healing by telling these stories and wanted it on record and i really felt strongly at at that point uh that was about 10 years ago that i was in the wrong i was on the wrong side of conflict so i had been working for 10 years prior uh during conflicts and after conflict on post-conflict reconciliation and really felt I need to switch and I need to do everything I can to prevent atrocities from happening, to prevent violence from happening uh, so that I'm not, we're not always hearing these these horrible stories. Uh, and shortly after, then I, I began working for AFSC where I'm, I'm currently working the American Friends Service Committee. It's a Quaker peace and social justice organization uh, and I'm associate general secretary there. Uh, and, and we really uh, have, have focused primarily on how do we interrupt violence, how do we reduce war and conflict, uh, and how do we prevent and dismantle systems of oppression and violence. So there's been a few pivotal points in my life and career. Uh, I would say that, you know, the Peace Corps being one, uh, my experience with 9-11, personal experience with my brother, and then Liberia and just being struck um, struck by, by the need to do more to, on the preventative side. Um, I, I also had another a really unique moment in Afghanistan. I was uh, training women who were running for political office and uh, you know, it was very dangerous for people that were running. They were um, going from house to house. Uh, we were going to different training centers to uh, for, for as a safety precaution. Many had fatwas issued against them. And um, and when I asked one woman, what can we do to, to try to uh, help women in Afghanistan, how to, to, to try to reduce conflict uh, and to, to end the war. And she said, go get more women elected in your office because it's, 
you know, you, you're encouraging this in my country, but you should do more in your country. And we know that uh, women are critical. Uh, the, the, if you have higher numbers of women in mass in political office, you have more peaceful outcomes, there's less corruption. Uh, so then after that experience, I went back and started a political action committee to support women financially who are running for office in the United States. Uh, so, you know, looking at multiple strategies for how do we create a more peaceful world and um, and 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 often. Uh, those, you know, shifts in my career have happened by really, really meaningful experiences like Afghanistan, Liberia and 9-11. As someone who's relatively new to the field of peace building, it's these kind of experiences I hear from people who've been in the field a while that make it easier to understand how you stay motivated in the, the more difficult times. Oh, yeah. And um, so you've worked in peace building for over two decades. You've been involved in projects all over the world, some of which you've just spoken about. What do you think has changed in the world in terms of violent conflict and peace building? How, how have the trends changed in that area? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, there's a few there's a few concerning trends uh, where we have um, o- over decades had had uh, we were having upticks in in peace in peaceful societies. There was uh, we we were making positive gains um, in in number of interstate wars. So we were on a positive trend. And over the past four years globally, we have seen a decrease in the peace index, which is uh, one index that we look at uh, in the peace building community as as the peacefulness of of societies. So we're seeing um, globally, we are seeing uh, an an uptick in in, in violence and in death. We are seeing uh, we're at our worst um, migration crisis since World War II, and and much of that is driven by conflict uh, from from you know places like Syria, um, also from violence. While it might not be a formal war, um, from violence from places like Latin America and Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, um, and so we're we're seeing these you know, just dis- more displaced people, we're seeing uh, more violence and, and it's a it's it's a disturbing trend. Um, however, on the positive side, we're seeing unity in peace building communities and collaboration in ways that we haven't seen before. Um, so I'm I'm part of a uh, a coalition called the Peace Plus Coalition, which is uh, and of which GPAC is a member, many of the the um, larger peace building organizations that are trying to work together to move the field of peace building. So we're seeing uh, increased coordination and collaboration uh, with a real effort to move the field. We're also seeing engagement from the Department of Defense's from uh, governments around the world to take this idea of peace building more seriously. Um, we're starting to make gains where, where um, places like the Pentagon, like Department of Defense in the United States, are not only saying anecdotally that they know peace building works, but we do have now uh, researchers that are saying empirically peace building works. Empirically, peace building is stronger than militarized approaches. Um, there's a really great, there's two really two really great researchers, Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan, uh, who have done some really critical work for our field, and they wrote a book uh, called. Um, what works, uh, which and looking at civil resistance, and showed empirically through a, a research over the past hundred years that uh, when you do nonviolent action to try to change a, regi- a regime positively, uh, there's a 52 percent uh, in higher likelihood that that will succeed compared to military intervention, which is 26 percent likelihood of success. So we empirically know. That peace building works, that nonviolent approaches work, that political solutions work, um, and we're starting to see more governments invest in them. We we need much more, and so we're just at the start of what I think is a really promising uh, opportunity for so many of us in the field to work together to try to shift the narrative globally and to try to uh, encourage countries to invest in these political and diplomatic toolkits to end violence and conflict. Okay, so you mentioned there the, uh, the disturbing trends we've seen in the last four years where peace and conflict, well, peace has become a little bit less prevalent in the world and conflict is again on the rise. 
what what is the cause of this in your mind? Why do you think this is? Hmm. I do think there are. I, I, I mean, there, there are answers that I just don't have off the top of my head that, um, from, from the reports. And there are, uh, you know, we do still have major conflict happening in Yemen, which isn't getting a lot of attention. Uh, there's still n- n- conflict going on in Afghanistan and Syria. Um, there's also, um, there had there has been an increased number of of mass violence attacks in the, in the, the past years. So um, it it is that these wide a few widespread wars that have been ongoing for some time without resolution, um, and also that there has been a, a slight uptick in in mass violence. We are also seeing as a as kind of a correlation to that. Globally, an increased an increase in restricted space. So, um, over the past few years, there has been increased restriction of civil society globally. Uh, a lot coming from the U.S. government uh, on an increase in, in sanctions and and um, uh, the terrorist legislation, the the legislation that's created to try to um, reduce the war on terror that's led by the, the U.S. government is leading to restrictions for peace building organizations where it's harder for us to send wires to places to, to fund uh, work happening in, in North Korea or in Somalia or in places where we really, really do need to fund peace building and some humanitarian service. So, um, yeah, so we we're, that's another disturbing trend that, you know, we're seeing more restricted space, a slight shift to authoritarianism in, in many governments. We're seeing some uh, a resurgence uh, globally, um, though not everywhere, in, in many countries and in, um, in violent uh, authoritarian language. Uh, and these are all, we're seeing an increase in the United States in, in hate speech, um, and in in racist uh, language used online, we're seeing an increase in in uh, violence against journalism uh, journalists. So these are all really troubling trends um, that we're monitoring, and and we try to interrupt uh, as much as possible. Absolutely, that is something I can certainly relate to in in Britain at the moment. Mm. And, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, so during these periods where things aren't looking as great as always. Um, We spoke about drawing from your experiences. How else can you stay motivated and also keep those who maybe look to you in the world of peace building? How how can you help them stay motivated as well? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And the, so we, so I, I created this anthology with Rue Freeman, who is um, my co-editor and the, the anthology, the book is called Indivisible Global Leaders on Shared Security. And we had this idea in January 2017. And I don't know if you can remember what was happening in January 2017, uh, but but Brexit, the Brexit vote had happened. Uh, Donald Trump had just been elected president in the United States. And um, there was a real feeling of, um, of despair, I would say, in the peace building community. And um, people that had been activists or peace builders uh, in the U.S. for for decades uh, were feeling um, really unsettled, and and Rue and I met and talked about, you know, how do we try to offer hope in a time that feels dark to some. And we started brainstorming ideas, and we said, well, you know, uh, she had written in an anthology on Palestine, and I said, why don't we try that for shared security? Um, and and what it really is is we contacted 41 leaders like Desmond Tutu, uh, Jimmy Carter, John Paul Lederach, who's a well-known peace builder. Um, so we we contacted 41 people who were leaders in peace building for decades, who've seen societies. Uh, change, who've gone through really difficult, trying times like the anti-apartheid movement, the civil rights movement, uh, individual uh, or uh, discrete conflicts like people who were peace builders in Uganda or or in North in Northern Ireland. So we we gathered stories of people who have amazing, amazing, heartbreaking, beautiful, hopeful uh, stories of why they're peace builders, why 
how do they stay motivated and what gives them strength? Uh, and the book really was meant to be something that lay people can understand. It's not just, we write a lot of wonky language, a lot of uh, academic policies. This is really meant to be something that anybody could pick up, read it, feel inspired, and know that you know, we're not, we're, even when things seem dark, there's always hope. There's always, there's always small wins. There's always positive change happening. So even though we have these, um, these, these, these concerning trends that we, I talked about before and the peace indexes in, in a uh, rise in authoritarianism, we are still seeing we're, we're in a really positive space in terms of uh, and a renewed awareness around climate change. The LGBTQ community has had more freedoms than, than they had in the past. So that is a movement that really made large strides. Uh, we see a reinsurgence of people active in, in uh, civil resistance who hadn't been before. We see the Me Too movement, which is really uh, fundamentally shifted the dialogue about, about violence and women and, and harassment in the workplace. So, so we so we know that even in dark times, we have to be vigilant and watch the dark, the the the, the, the disturbing trends, but also really to cel celebrate and amplify the positive things that are happening. And this book does that. Um, you know, we interview. Uh, some like Victor Ochen, who is a well-known youth. Um, he was an on, youth envoy for the UN. He's been really active in in uh, working to um, support former child soldiers. And you know, he talks about this experience of of meeting uh, the soldier who he believes killed his brother, and hiring that person. So you, in this book, we are we are using this book to demonstrate how. Everyday activists and peace builders can both change societies and then also find forgiveness and love and peace within themselves to do really remarkable things. And we hope we're we're using this book and and lifting up the work of the people, our partners and our staff, who every day are working in really trying uh, circumstances and conditions to build peace. And they're doing this bravely. They're doing this courageously. They're doing this with with a much smaller investment than we'd like to see globally in the peace building space. Um, so that's that's what we do. We have to try to lift up where we see it working. We have to try to talk more about where it's not working. Um, and we really try to be that bridge that amplifies the work that's happening on the ground to power centers globally and, and um, and really to be that, to try to bring that hope, to say there is there is really amazing work. We do know that peace building works and here's the successes. So um, there's 41 good examples in Indivisible, the book on that demonstrate that. Oh, that's great to hear. I mean, I did want to speak about your book. It's called uh, Indivisible yeah. Global Leaders on Shared Security. And I was aware that it uh, had all these stories from these incredible people. But I didn't know it also had a, one of the aims for it was to help keep people involved in peace building, motivated. That's a really, really good aspect of that, I think. Yeah, it was really, I mean, this was like a, a labor of love because we were trying to find hope. Like what, you know, feels really dark. What can we do to find inspiration? And it's amazing when you go, when when I keep rereading the book as I'm talking about it. And, and uh, every time I read it, I pick up something different as a person and as a practitioner. Um, a lot of people write about about breath and write about uh, using meditation to try to center themselves to do better work. Uh, people write about the need for peace builders to be in nature and to garden and to dig into the dirt and to be rooted. So you find uh, examples where you know Desmond Tutu writes about his example, use his thinking about um, inspiration, the the good the story of the Good Samaritan in the Bible is his is his inspiration uh, to keep him going. And this belief that no matter what, if, if somebody doesn't look like you, doesn't speak your language, you still have an obligation to the world to to be neighborly and to love. So you have these and then then we have situations where people are talking about their experiences in war zones. So it's it really is there's there's something in the book for everybody to get uh, both to improve your practice as a peace builder, but then also as a human to think what what helps to heal people. How do you find grace? How do you find love? How do you how do you uh, how do you really? I think it imp I, you find stories that help you improve your life. Absolutely. I mean, for those who aren't aware, could you could you elaborate on what shared security is? How it's different to national security? How we should be moving away from that, and yeah. what it means to you. 
Absolutely. Yep. So shared security is it's our language. It's the word that we've used to um, to move from a traditional security approach to a collective collaborative approach to security and one which really embodies the belief that your piece is my piece nationally individually and in a community that and this is this is not a new idea this is around this idea is in exists in every culture it's been around for thousands of years uh in 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 uh swahili it's called ubuntu this idea that my piece is your piece that we never will get to a place where all of us can thrive if we're looking at security from a militarized zero-sum frame that we have to be looking at at it like nature looking at an interconnected uh interconnected uh, approach where when we when we looked how can we all have security safety peace will succeed and you know in the book everybody writes um has a different a slightly different idea of what security means to them and i'll give you i'll give you my example which a really uh you know kind of personal example but i i my kids go to school in new jersey in a great school and um and when I went to their elementary school play, I uh, there's a pl- an armed police officer at the play, and um, and it's just striking that 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 we need that in the United States. And, and about a year ago, I was in Switzerland, and I was walking through a park, and uh, I was walking uh, on this road, and it's, something struck me as different, and I couldn't quite place my finger on it. So what 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 is different here? Um, and I realized I was walking through an open air school where kids were playing. I was walking through a playground, which you can't do that in the United States anymore. Um, so my idea of security is is a, a world in which we can go to school and go to pray and go to work uh, without threat of violence, where the crises in Syria, war in Syria and Yemen are are approached with political and diplomatic solutions with the same vigor as they are with um, militarized solutions. And the actually, the this the idea for my work on shared security uh, came about five years ago. FCNL, which is the Friends Committee for National Legislation, which is the Quaker uh, lobbying body in the United States, worked with AFSC's DC office to put forward this idea of shared security, um, which was a a vision for a just foreign policy. And it outlined four principles, one of which were peaceful means to peaceful ends. uh, And and also it included a um, a stewardship for our planet, uh, rule of law and inclusive governance uh, for for all. And I was in a meeting in, in DC on Syria where many, uh, you know, 50 bright people were talking about, this is five years ago, we're talking about Syria and possible solutions. And at the end of the day, the facilitator did a temperature poll to see how many people in the room thought that there were political and diplomatic non-military solutions to Syria. And uh, as you might imagine, uh, in that room of 50, five years ago, only two of us, including myself, believed that there was a political solution to Syria. And to me, that was just astounding. It was heartbreaking, and it demonstrated to me the lack of imagination and investment in the non-military toolkit. And so that's, to me, what shared security is. It's this idea that we have robust uh, options to resolve our conflicts, to resolve wars that that do not involve military, that do not involve uh, a, a militarized framework or approach, and that we are creative and innovative and and compassionate to each other to come up with collaborative solutions to our problems. Absolutely. I mean, I can really relate to some of your stories there. I mean, I remember being in Honduras and seeing a, a security guard at a supermarket with a shotgun, which for me yeah. was yeah. very surprising. And then I was in Colombia when the um, the peace plebiscite, when that was yeah. voted down. Mm. And uh, now I'm living in the Netherlands where things are quite different. So I can and certainly relate like- to some of those experiences. Absolutely. It's striking when you know when when it's striking now and you get you get used to it really quickly um, and start to think of it as, as not a, the, the militarized frame. You, you, you it's easy for societies to feel like that's the solution um, and we don't believe it is. 
Absolutely. I mean, with regards to share, shared security, what do you think the role of civil society organizations is? How can how, how can they best be involved? Uh, so, I mean, civil society is leading the charge for shared security. So every all of the work that our partners are doing uh, on the ground is what will change the, the work and the world. I mean, we feel like in the, the, ind- the countries that we're working in, it is the activists, it's civil society, it is the uh, leaders, it's um, it's the peace builders that will come up with the solution for the conflict. And it's our job as an international non- NGO to to support that, to to amplify that, to provide resources w- when we can to civil society, and to be led by them. Um, there's a lot of really great organizations that are doing work on locally led peace building, like Peace Direct, and we wholeheartedly believe in in that strategy and approach and think that it's our role to to amplify that and to try to move the field so that the voices of the people in the conflict zones in in the violence affect the violent affected areas that they're the ones that are their solutions are heard their voices are heard and they have access to decision makers fantastic and um, so that kind of work is also something we 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 try and do here at GPAC as well yes, get involved you do. in local peace organizations um, working from the ground up so for this for this season, we've added a couple of questions we want to ask each guest on our show in order to learn a bit about the opinions and priorities of individual peace builders working in different areas and how they compare to see basically what is their personal aim in the world of peace building. So what is something you hope to see achieved in the world of peace building globally or locally within the next year? Mm, the next year. Mm. Or maybe the next five years, if you prefer, in a, in in a, in a short time frame. Yes. So I, I would love to see, um, I would love to see the Peace Plus Coalition have some demonstrated success in increasing everyday people's awareness of, of the effectiveness of peace building. So I think if, you know, if you ask somebody outside of our field, what is it, what is it, mean to be a peace builder? Uh, what does peace building look like? Does peace building work? I, I don't think we'd get the same answers <laughs> as if you ask people in our field. So I would love to see an increased public awareness of uh, of the efficacy and the uh, the success of peace building. And I think that's a doable possible goal. Absolutely. And with that in mind, if you would like to debunk one myth or common misconception for those people about peace building, what would that be? Absolutely. My favorite, it's, this is not a soft, fluffy thing. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm in circles that work on peace building and I'm in circles that work on national security and the circles of national security get taken so much more seriously when this is really complex uh, work. This is really important work. And we know that peace building works. We, I've, I've had conversations uh, with people in the military, with a, a, a very well-regarded general who worked for the Department of Defense, who says we in in the Department of Defense know that war doesn't work. And I find over and over again that the the loudest, uh, most vocal um, supporters of milita- militarized action are people who have not been in a war zone. And <clears throat> the peace builders and the soldiers, <clears throat> we know what a bullet or a machete can do to a person. We know how that ravages communities. We know uh, that that takes decades to to for for communities to to heal from trauma. We know we know this. Um, the soldiers know this. The Department of Defense knows this. I, I think maybe politicians may not know this, uh, and the general public don't may not know this. So I think for us to debunk that idea that this is soft. And also to debunk the idea that military action is the best solution. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, we know in the Department of Defense that war doesn't work is a great quote. I'll definitely take that away from that. Yeah, sure. Okay, so just to jump back to your book for a second, could you uh, tell us how we can how we can get that? How we can obtain a copy? Absolutely. So you can uh, pick up the book anywhere uh, where most books are are purchased. You can go on Amazon. You can Google Indivisible Global Leaders on, on Shared Security. You can go to AFSC's website, um, the um, AFSC.org slash Indivisible. And there we'll see a schedule of 
all of our book events because we're doing a number of, of book readings around the world um, and also a link to buy the book. Uh, you can buy it um, right on our our publisher's website, which is Olive Print Press. So any if you Google Indivisible Global Leaders on Shared Security, um, there's, there's many, you know, most places where you can get books, you can get it. We don't have it in an Audible file yet, so it's a um, print copy. But uh, yeah, I hope you pick it up. I think that we find that it 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 does give uh, something different to everybody who reads it because you get these 41 different voices. Um, and we do hope that it gives you some inspiration and some hope. Absolutely. Everyone definitely go and check it out. Great. Thanks for being here today, Kerry. Um, some fabulous insights and I really enjoyed it. Thank you. I did too. I love I love having these conversations and I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for listening to today's episode of The Peace Corner. If you're interested in hearing more from us, please click subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you might be listening. And tune in next time when our knowledge, policy, advocacy, and gender intern, Amanda, will be talking to the director of the UN Regional Information Center in Brussels, Deborah Seward, about the Sustainable Development Goals.